Welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Chetwin Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene. Let's pray. Grace and peace from God our Father and from Jesus Christ who came to take away the sin of the world. Grace and peace from God the Holy Spirit who convicts us, cleanses us and is committed to helping us reflect God's holy image in our world today. Amen. If we've been following the path that leads to the cross, we find that Jesus was traveling through the area and headed for Jerusalem. He knew what would transpire there. He knew what he was headed for and he was on a mission to complete the work he came to earth to accomplish. He spent the time in the various villages and towns preaching and teaching and coming against the religious leaders of the day. We know that Jesus was headed to Jerusalem because it says back in Luke 9:51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, some translations say that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. I love that imagery. He was determined. He was resolute. He was intently, purposefully, single-mindedly, unfalteringly, unflinchingly headed for Jerusalem. There was nothing, absolutely nothing, in this universe that could stop him from reaching Jerusalem and fulfilling his purpose of making a way for our salvation. And the main scripture for this morning speaks about just such a case where it would have been easy for Jesus to take a detour from his trip. Luke 13, verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees said to him, Get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Now, if you read the preceding verses of the 13th chapter of Luke, you will find that Jesus had preached about repentance. He had healed a crippled woman on the Sabbath day. He told a parable about the kingdom of God, and he told another parable about what it takes to be saved and the tragic end for those who are not. Probably the most upsetting thing for the rulers of the synagogue in this series of events was the healing on the Sabbath. After this exchange, the common people were delighted and the leaders of the synagogue were humiliated because of their selfish motives and they had been revealed. So it's not a big surprise that the religious leaders told Jesus to basically get lost, take a hike. Now, were the Pharisees really interested in Jesus' behavior or his welfare? They were indicating that they had some insider knowledge that Herod wanted to kill Jesus. But was that true? Herod did finally get to see Jesus, and his initial reaction was not to kill Jesus, but something quite different. Just listen. Luke 23, verse 8. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he had heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. Now, that's rather odd. The rulers said that Herod wanted to kill Jesus. But we find that Herod was actually looking forward to seeing him. However, in all fairness, Herod was initially very concerned that Jesus might be John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. So we really don't know how Herod felt about Jesus at this particular point. All we know is what the Pharisees said. Now, if the Pharisees really knew of Herod's plans and wanted to help Jesus avoid Herod's grasp, it seems as if they would have given him some direction as to how to avoid Herod's men. For instance, if they knew that Herod's men were coming from the south, they might have advised Jesus to head north, east, or west. But they didn't. They just said, leave this place and go somewhere else. In other words, just get out of here. We've had enough of you and your parables and miracles. Do you ever react like the Pharisees did when someone or the Holy Spirit confronts you about sin in your life? How do we react when confronted? It may be a caring friend, a piece of scripture that you read, a sermon, or the conviction of the Holy Spirit during prayer. How do we react? Would we say to our brother or sister in Christ, leave this place and go somewhere else? Or would we be gracious and ask for their help and prayer in the matter? Would we turn our back on Jesus and keep sinning or ask him to stay longer and help us with the problem? 
We can learn a lesson from these Pharisees, how these Pharisees reacted when confronted with their prideful response to the teachings of Christ. Jesus' work and death and his life would not be determined by Herod or the Pharisees. His life was planned and directed by God himself, and his mission would unfold in God's time and according to God's plan. With that being said, let's continue on with this great scripture. Luke 13, verse 32 and 33. Jesus replied, Go tell that fox that I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and the third day I will accomplish my purpose. Yes, today, tomorrow, and the next day I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. This is exactly the result and the response of someone who is determined to go to Jerusalem, even though it means death. Why was Jesus so determined to go to Jerusalem? Why was he willing to walk into the jaws of certain death? What was the driving force behind this unwavering path to seeming destruction? Well, Jerusalem, the city of God, symbolized the entire nation. It was Israel's largest city, the nation's spiritual and political capital, and Jews from around the world frequently visited it. However, Jerusalem also had a history of rejecting God's prophets. We read in John 4, 34, Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. My food, Jesus said, that which sustains my physical and spiritual life is to do the will of his Father and to accomplish the task set before him. In John 5.30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just, because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. And then again, in John 6, verse 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. In these verses, the speaker is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, from the Nicene Creed. And this, Jesus is saying, is his purpose for being here. His motivating drive is to do the will of the Father who sent him and to complete the task assigned to him. This is the Jesus. This is Jesus, not some mere human, but God himself with an all-consuming goal of pleasing his Father. Now here is the major lesson we need to learn. We have talked about this before and it bears repeating. We are not the center of the universe. God is not standing by attentively waiting to see what it is we need so he can fulfill our every wish. In the Western world, the human-God relationship has been turned upside down. If the goal of Jesus is to please his Father and accomplish the task assigned to him, shouldn't that be our goal as well? But no, we have preachers who preach that faith in Christ brings a life of wealth, health, and the removal of all things unpleasant. On the other hand, we have preachers who preach a private faith that never needs to be shared and that this private faith may not actually be truth for others because all roads lead to God and a universal salvation or even reincarnation. But Jesus, the Son of God, by contrast, sets his face toward Jerusalem with the exclusive purpose of completing the task assigned to him, even though it would mean his death on the cross of torture and humiliation. And all of his disciples, except for Judas, attempted to make sure that the world was aware of one great truth, that Christ crucified, risen, and coming again was and is the only path to salvation. Now, what about us? Do you have a goal in your life? What is it? Have you set your face toward the cross of Christ and the kingdom of God? Or is your goal of this world popularity, financial success, power, fame, independence, relaxation, Think about it. What is the driving force in your life? If the last week of your life or my life was replayed for the world to see, what would they see as the driving goal? What would they see your face set towards? Think about what you've done in the work of the kingdom of God in the last year, besides attending church. Some of you have poured out your lives serving others for the cause of Christ. Some of you have set your faces toward the goal set before you, 
of accomplishing the will of the Father. Now, granted, that's been a lot more difficult this past year, with COVID biting on our heels and restricting our movements, but we still have neighbors. We still can connect with the lost and the hurting. To those of you who have set your faces, may the Lord bless you and increase your numbers. The final point we want to take a look at very briefly this morning is found in verse 34, where Jesus said, Luke 13, verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. In this great verse, we see the eternity of Christ in the triune Godhead. Here we see Jesus looking back over history, seeing how many times he had sent the prophets to his wayward children, beckoning them to return to him for their physical and spiritual lives longing to protect them, sending messenger after messenger with invitations of protection and warnings of disobedience, and then finally coming himself in order to make all things plain to those of us who seek him with all our hearts. In my mind's eye, I can imagine the eternal Christ looking down from heaven over his chosen people, Israel, longing to be their God and for them to be his people, but they are not willing. God is still looking down he is ever vigilant. He's looking right now down into this sanctuary. He knows our hearts. He knows the driving force of our lives. Is it him or some facet of this world? Are we like Jesus with our face set resolutely toward accomplishing the will of the Father and the completion of the task he has set before us? If we are, then we can be rest assured that this eternal Jesus has gathered us to himself and we are protected by his eternal strength. Now, all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Jude, chapter 1, verse 24 to 25. God bless you all.